like to thank everybody for joining us here today for the briefing. Uh, my name is Brett Murphy. I'm the Managing Director of Corporate Communications for Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, just came in the briefing today, uh, a few remarks will be given by Mayor Mike Savage, as well as uh, Erica Flack, Director of Emergency Management. We also have several people from our team available uh, to answer questions. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Joe Moore, who's our Executive Director of Community Safety, Kathy O'Toole, our Chief Administrative Officer, uh, Fire Chief Ken Steubing, um, and of course, Councillor Pam Lovelace from the area that's most in deeply impacted. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll allow the Mayor to speak. Thank you, uh, thank you, Breton. Um, Thank you to my colleagues who are here today, including my uh, colleague on council, uh, Councillor Pam Lovelace. Uh, bonjour à tous, Gwei Njelazi. Thank you for joining us. I know folks are perhaps watching us on live stream as well, so I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, we've indicated who's with us to answer some questions. We will hear from Erica Fleck in a few minutes. So I'll just say a few opening words and then turn things over to the operational leads, after which we're happy to take your questions. We want to address some of the common questions arising from the impacted communities of this fire. So um, I may actually throw a few to staff after the media are finished, if there are some questions that have left unanswered at that point. And those will be things that we've heard that Councillor Lovelace has been hearing, that my office have been hearing, that the folks here have been hearing. We're glad to have this opportunity today to bring the public up to date as we continue to shift from the active firefighting and wide scale evacuation to community return and recovery. We wanna let people know everything that we know and we wanna let people know the things that we don't know. Return and recovery efforts represent their own massive challenges and I'll let our staff speak to those considerations and what's needed as we plan to get more people back into their neighborhoods and continue to work with those who have lost their homes. We remain committed to addressing community safety and to helping people regain what was lost. As residents return to their communities, we know that those communities are forever changed and that there will be questions and concerns. Tomorrow it is our intent, our plan, that the majority of people who are still evacuated will be able to return to their homes. We will issue an alert when that happens. Please keep in mind that not every street can be listed on the alert, but there will be public service announcements that people can go and they can look at what communities and what streets are able to return. I wanna to speak to those who are most directly affected, the people who are devastated by the loss of their home. They are for foremost in our mind. And we're gonna set up a process and continue setting up processes to speak directly to those people and to assist them in the recovery ahead. And Erica can speak to that. So much work still lies ahead and I know it will challenge our time and our resources, but it will not diminish our resolve. I want to encourage everybody to come out on Friday for the terrific lineup at the benefit concert for the Scotiabank Center and to give, the wildfire fun and to, give to the wildfire funds established by the United Way Halifax and the Canadian Red Cross I want to thank uh, Brooks Diamond and Sonic Entertainment and all the artists who are making themselves available. And again, I want to extend my gratitude and that of Council to all the firefighters, emergency responders, EMO professionals, community supporters, businesses, and everybody who has played a role in helping us manage through the most devastating fire of our times. And keep in mind, it's still early June. We need to be vigilant. We need to follow safety. We need to be very careful because uh, as we're seeing across the country, firefights, fire, wildfires are not going away. We have to do everything we can, first of all, to avoid them uh, and then to make sure that we can deal with them. The work continues. Thank you very much. I'll now ask uh, Erica Fleck, who is our Director of Emergency Management to say a few words. Erica. Thank you, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, HRM is entirely focused on getting homeowners and residents back to their neighborhoods when it is safe to do so. We are working closely with all of our provincial partners and service providers to make that happen. 
In the next day or so, we are also establishing a community hub that will allow residents to come in one-on-one -on -one to ask questions in groups, but again, one-on-one -on -one availability for those who do not wish to be in a group environment with the trauma that they have gone through. We will have smoke kits available for homeowners when they do get, uh, for those who are allowed to go back in tomorrow, we'll have smoke kits available, all the instructions and the supplies to go with them that again will allow residents to make a safer entry into their home. We will have potable water containers and potable water sources, so drinking water for those who, uh, again, the notices have gone out about contamination and we expect to have further information on that from the province later on today. Uh, we're very happy to announce that we've entered into a contract with Team Rubicon, who have uh, volunteers, 50 to 60 volunteers, arriving next weekend. Um, their advance party will be on the ground on Sunday, and therefore we will be establishing uh, a community meeting with those who have been directly impacted with destroyed or uh, large, uh, sorry, greatly damaged homes. And it will be just be for them, and we are communicating that, or it may have just gone out this afternoon. Team Rubicon will assist all of those homeowners in being able to sift through and look for prized possessions that may have survived the fire and be able to do so in a safe way. So they will have complete hazmat suits, they are properly trained, and they will work directly with the homeowners if the homeowners want. And again, all of that information will be given out later. Uh, fencing. I just want to talk about fencing for a minute as we're getting lots of questions. It is under the, uh, under the Fire Act that Houses that are damaged or destroyed must have fencing provided around it. Again, as I mentioned uh, in previous days, we have uh, some sites with well caps missing, open sewer, obviously, you know, partially damaged, say a basement that's uh, one wall standing, water sources, um, you know, lots of house hazards, as well as the contamination in the ground. So they need to be fenced. And that is going directly once the house is secure, sorry, or the site is complete of the investigation, it then gets handed over to the homeowner and the insurance company to deal with. But it is legislation that we must fence those properties and the fences are not damaging any further on the residents' properties. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Erica. I also just want to say before we go to questions, uh, we've worked with the province over the last uh, 10 days uh, on this and we had this uh, our media availability at two o'clock so that we wouldn't conflict with the provincial press conference which i understand is still going on at three o'clock but there are people who have uh, questions specific to the halifax area our thoughts are with other people not only in nova scotia now but across the country who are suffering losses and devastation from uh, wildfires so i'll turn it over to brett and murphy Mr. Mayor, just a, a reminder for folks, because of course we have, in addition to CART uh, for the, the live broadcast on our on our YouTube channel, we have American Sign Language. So we would ask that if possible, that we have a microphone there in the back, if reporters could use that. And, and if it's awkward to do, we'll just make sure the question is repeated as best we can so that it's captured uh, for accessibility. Uh, we'll be taking, and I would ask that, you know, one question, one follow-up, because we have a couple people who are dialing in, a media representatives, we'll go to them to ensure that everyone has a chance to ask questions and then back to the room. Uh, so thanks very much for that. Okay, do you want me to just moderate the question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Clearly, there are still a couple of no-go zones, though, and I wonder, for the sake of expediency, can, can you tell us what those no-go zones are and what makes them continue to be no-go zones? Sure. I'm going to ask uh, Erica to speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just to confirm, um, so we have three areas of significant impact, um, which the map has been showing uh, all along. So what we've been calling the dark orange zone. So not only is it, again, uh, burned down, uh, partial structures, some roads are impassable. Um, we did have if fuel spills. Um, there's a significant list of items that, have, um, that are still with big safety risks in those areas. So right now we're trying to fine tune them and basically make a cordon around those areas, again, to let people go back when it's safe to do so. So the larger areas are a bit easier as we get down to the nitty gritty. 
we have to take it street by street, host by host, to really look at and make sure that we're not sending people um, into an unsafe environment. Thank you. And my other question is for the fire chief, actually. I don't know if he minds uh, taking one. Uh, this is a bit of a procedural question, but, you know, we've had a lot of rain the last few days. And, and for those of us who aren't firefighters, I'm sure we're wondering to, to what degree that is effective in allowing you and your colleagues to be able to say this thing is, is done and over with. Can you talk a little bit about what goes into getting us to that point or what still needs to happen before you and your colleagues feel comfortable making a declaration like that? Sure. Good question. So first of all, I will you know, share with you, we are not the wildland experts. That would be DNRR. So certainly working closely with our colleagues. It is not uncommon in these type of events for there to be a long, long time until the fire is declared out. So we've had a lot of questions around that. You know, obviously you've heard the terminology around the fire has been surrounded, the fire is controlled, but uh, the declaration of a fire being out for such a high heat event some takes, uh, sometimes takes significant time. So, for example, in Fort McMurray, it took almost a year for the fire to be declared out. So DNRR takes the lead in that assessment. They continue to have boots on the ground and will continue to monitor the situation. Uh, some of that is based on forecasting, obviously precipitation. Uh, we will work alongside them, and when they declare that uh, fire out, uh, they will make that declaration and share it. But our crews remain ready and available to respond and actually, you know, as residents return to the area, we would ask, ask them to be diligent in looking for signs of smoke and obviously reporting that as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, how many people were evacuated or households were evacuated and how many are still, uh, still not back in their homes? Who wants to take that? Erica? Um, so the original number at our highest that were evacuated, evacuated was just over 16,000. Currently, we have approximately 4,100 that are still evacuated. Which most of whom will be uh, allowed to go back tomorrow. We, that's our intent at this point in time. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, the fencing issue, so uh, homeowners are responsible for putting up a fence, and what should that fence look like? Um, so the question on fencing, um, so it's for a safety. It's not the homeowner's responsibility. The city is doing that in conjunction with insurance companies, with Insurance Bureau of Canada and other agencies. So the city is constructing around those uh, currently, and we will continue to do so over the next few days until they are all complete for any structure that was destroyed or major damage. Just out of curiosity, with the uh, burn restrictions in the province going to the highest level possible and fines uh, being increased with a zero tolerance uh, to, toward illegal burns. Does the city have a general idea how many calls the fire department has responded or city bylaw has responded to in regards to illegal burns uh, in the province or in the area? Thank you for the question. If I understand it correctly, you were asking how many burns that we were called to ended up being illegal burns. So obviously this is a sensitive subject right now and rightly so. So we are getting many, many calls to investigate what appears to be smoke or visible flame. Sometimes that flame is from a propane appliance, which is totally allowed under the no burn bylaw, providing you're using it as per manufacturer's instructions. Uh, we've only had a small amount of illegal burns where we're pursuing uh, charges. So we are responding. Uh, last night, for example, I think it was six calls. The previous night it was 10 to 12 calls but a very, very small percentage of those are actually ones that will have follow-up. And Chief, I think it goes without saying that while this fire is contained, we've got months ahead of us of potential fire season, and so people have to remain 
uh, vigilant um, and uh, recognize that uh, we're in a dangerous time. Breton? Well, oh, yes, hi. Sorry. Uh, just looking for confirmation as to the number of uh, heavily damaged or destroyed properties. So the number of destroyed properties? We know that destroyed properties is 151. Um, pardon me? Homes? homes? Homes. Yeah, 151 homes. So that's homes that people live in, yeah. So what about the 60 pieces per? Another 60 uh, buildings, structures. Okay. And uh, I've seen the number 10 days floating around for people with more damage. Uh, do we have a timeline for them, for the people at the heart of the fire? So I'm going to let uh, Erica or uh, Billy speak to that. Um, They'll give you the information. What I'll tell you is that it is our intent to reach out to those people, give them or give them every opportunity to have the discussion that they need. They are those who have paid the heaviest price in this fire, and they're the ones that we want to make sure that we're understanding what we can do to assist. Um, did you want to speak to it too, Erica? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, sorry. Uh, just in terms of the more damaged properties or destroyed properties, uh, for residents try trying to get back into those homes or that area, uh, timeline heard 10 days floating around. Do we have a better estimate to that going into next week? There is no better estimate right now. Again, there's so many details to work through with this getting people in there safely. Um, and we are trying to tee that up again with Team Rubicon coming in to assist homeowners you know, if they want to sift through and, and their uh, their boots on the ground, the, the 60 people ish arrive next weekend. Um, so we're hoping to kind of line everything up at the same time. If we can let them back in earlier, obviously, then we will certainly do so. But again, it's that safety aspect that we're we're working very hard to make that safe for them to go in. And I'll just jump in. If everyone here, I believe, in the room has had an opportunity to ask a question and a follow up. Um, we've got a couple people on the line, so I'd maybe turn to uh, Adrian Blanc from uh, Radio Canada to ask a question uh, and a follow-up, if he wishes. What areas are involved in Really? Ahead, we'll try that now. Can you hear me? Maybe we'll uh, we'll just come back to make sure we've got connectivity there with our team. Um, and if there is a question, um, obviously Adrian and we have uh, Sarah Plowman. If they have a particular question and they're having problems with the technical, they can email their question to media relations uh, team. They have the address because they registered for this. Um, one thing that I know was brought to my attention to just uh, let folks know, I believe the, the, the conference, the press conference that was originally scheduled for three o'clock by the province, they've announced that that is not moving forward. Is that correct? So just we'll people are aware. What's that? We'll move back to three. Yes, yeah, exactly. All right, thanks. Are there uh, qu more questions in the room? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I'm just wondering if you have had any conversations with the province yet about the availability of modular homes for folks who have lost their home and what you know about how that's going to work. I don't know. Erica might be best to answer that, too. Uh, I've had general conversations with uh, John Lohr, the Minister of Housing, who was up in Ottawa this week on other issues. Um, but I don't know the specifics of it. We'll certainly play a role in, in assisting if we possibly can. Um, it's obviously something the province have indicated that they will take a lead on. Go ahead, sir. Maybe for uh, Chief Stubing, but uh, we have heard that uh, some retired firefighters had offered their assistance during the uh, height of the fires and uh, weren't taken up on that offer. Uh, does someone comment on that? So the question was, uh, we've heard that some retired firefighters have offered their assistance, and what happened with that is the question. Well, they apparently weren't taken up on the offer. Okay. Chief? Thank you for your question. Uh, two streams of people that were called into service, obviously, are active members, uh, both career and volunteer, but so were many other divisions of the department. Uh, one of the skill sets that we identified a need for support for was for investigations. The challenge with investigations is it takes some time to become trained and competent. 
So besides the fire marshal's office assisting with some of those investigations, we did call back two recently retired investigators to assist with that work uh, on a temporary uh, assignment. Uh, we have had people who have formally retired from the department as volunteers who are in discussions with us now about reactivating. It's not a simple process, but certainly we are entertaining all conversations with people who want to join our volunteer complement. Anybody else? Uh, Brett, anybody on the line? Uh, I will just say that uh, we recognize there are a few folks on the line. We'll make sure as a group that we respond to every inquiry that comes through uh, to our public affairs team and follow up with the media who weren't able to connect through with questions uh, over the phone today. So thanks very much for your patience and, uh, and we'll make sure we follow up with you promptly. <laughs> I'm just, going to, I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask a few questions myself, actually, and then I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Lovelace to sort of close us up. We, we've been getting a number of questions, and usually the media ask all the questions, but I want to make sure that we give people a voice who have been calling in to both Councillor Lovelace, calling to myself and other councillors and to this uh, office, and some of them have been asked by you. One of the questions we get a lot is when can residents return to areas still under evacuation order? I think we've answered that, the criteria. I think, Erica, you spoke to, to that. Um, how will families be kept up to date? We have a plan, for, particularly for those most directly affected, that uh, we want to deal with them in whatever way is best. I want to thank Erica and Bill Moore, who have been out to community meetings this uh, week. We're dealing with people who are clearly and understandably um, distressed by what's happened uh, to, their, to their homes um, and their belongings. And so I want to thank Bill and Erica for doing that, and that will continue. And I think Erica will go to any meeting that you call as long as she's uh, not doing something else. So thank you, uh, Erica, for that. Um, one of the questions we had a lot was why media was allowed inside the evacuation zone. So I may take a crack at that. Um, Today's what, Wednesday? No, Thursday. Probably Tuesday or Wednesday right here, we were asked why media weren't allowed to go in at that point in time. Um, and I recognize the importance of the media in getting the message out, but we also wanted to make sure that people had a chance to see the homes themselves before uh, it was widely circulated. Unfortunately, a lot of images were sent out um, through a number of channels, so people found out that their houses were destroyed um, through channels other than direct official channels. Um, but we tried to do everything we could to make sure that people had an opportunity to go in and see their property and their community. Um, but we did also, so that we didn't, the media went in on, was it Monday? Or this week or Sunday? Um, but Tuesday? I don't know what today is. But we did try to make sure that people in the area got to see firsthand before that was reports in the media. Is anything else on that? Pretty much done. Um, HRM fencing and soil testing, we've spoken to that under the authority. Well testing kits, I think we've spoken to. What levels of security are being implemented in the affected area? Maybe, did we talk to that? Yeah, could I maybe ask Erica or Bill to speak to the levels of security in the affected area? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, this is a question that we're getting uh, daily through multiple avenues. And for those in the severely impacted area and throughout for those uh, under the complete evacuation area, security is provided 24 seven. And that is a combination of the RCMP, contracted security and our bylaw enforcement uh, officers. We're all working together to ensure that there's 24 seven patrols, especially since we know that people ran out of their houses very quickly in some cases, doors aren't secured and we are monitoring those 24 seven. Thank you, uh, Erica. I think Everything else that I had that was a commonly asked question was asked either by yourselves uh, or, or we've just addressed. Um, I'm going to ask Councillor Lovelace uh, if she wants to say a few words um, before we wrap up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to our staff. Um, you know, I, I want to thank residents for their patience. I know this has been a very difficult uh, and stressful, and devastating uh, process. Uh, communications, uh, I think, is the top thing that people continue to ask me. We need to be communicated to. And so I just want to be very clear that we are doing everything in our power to make sure that you have the information available to you that you're looking for. 
when we don't have access to the information, we try to find it. Um, and obviously, as you can see from the re-entry and recovery phase that we're in right now, this is very complex. We wanna make sure that people are safe as they return to their neighborhoods and ensure that, uh, that those structures are secure and also ensure that uh, residents and property owners who are returning to this area have the support that they need. It is devastating. Uh, especially to young children um, and family members who have never seen this kind of thing before. Our community has changed uh, drastically. And so I want to make sure that residents are aware if they haven't touched base uh, with an HRM employee, please call 311 to let us know to ensure that our staff can reach out to you and speak to you about your destroyed uh, property or destruction that is uh, on or near your property. In addition to that, uh, the provincial government has 211 available to folks to um, let them know uh, if you are looking for housing, if you are looking for, for, for support. So there's many donation areas uh, if, you're, if you're needing clothes or, or items. And also 811 is available for health support. And uh, I just want to thank, uh, again, our staff who have done an incredible job connecting with residents, creating this reentry and recovery phase, and, and initiating and implementing uh, this plan and to ensure that when we do get back into this, into these devastated neighborhoods, uh, that you have the support that you need. And uh, if you do need anything at all and you feel like you're not getting it, you can always reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, you Councillor Lovelace. Just to look over to see if anybody else has any other words at this point in time. Uh, I would like Eric, Erica Fleck to come up and have a few words. And, and Councillor Lovelace uh, just tweaked me on something that's come up a lot that I want to mention. So although, you know, there's a lot of focus, obviously, on, on residents who have had their homes destroyed or damaged, and speaking with some friends and family in the affected areas, but their homes are still, st still standing, there's a lot of survivor guilt, as I call it. So I just, you know, people need to be cognizant that just because your home is still standing doesn't mean that you're not affected. A lot of mental trauma, um, again, with children, pets, neighbours, um, you know, the devastation across your community, that that is something that we are looking at as well. And when we do set up the community hub, we will have mental health uh, resources. And also with Team Rubicon, when they come in with the homeowners, um, when we do the sifting process to look for those valuables, we will have mental health supports available as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of questions from reporters. Breton? One with Radio Canada, yes. with Adrian. Yes, I'll, I'll hop in here, thanks. So uh, Adrian uh, Blau from uh, Radio Canada asks, what areas will be freed exactly? Phase three, area of significant impact. And the second follow-up question, I'll wait till the first one's answered so we don't complicate things. Uh, Adrian, if I just understood the question, it is uh, the phases of phase three or the timelines for phase three? Okay, um, so phase three, it's still a bit of a moving target, as we'll say. We're still working through to make sure street by street, safe entry into the neighborhoods that the uh, HRM infrastructure, again, working with our partners. So there's no determination as of right now. We're still working through that. Um, but what we do know is the area of significant impact, i.e. The, the dark orange zones, um, will still be uh, some days from now. Thank you. And the follow-up question from uh, Adrian um, at Radio Canada is, why not tell people now? Why wait until tomorrow at an unknown time? Uh, so Adrian, uh, just as for your question, why not now? So as I just mentioned, we're still working through the finer details, again, street by street. A uh, lot of coordination. We have to work with our policing partners, security, to make sure that uh, the correct checkpoints, roadblocks are in place so that people aren't going into an unsafe zone. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we have streets that are not passable. Um, you know, working through those, again, working with the service providers, um, you know, making yesterday we had a, an oil tank leak blow. We had a propane tank blow, um, you know, making sure that those uh, issues are not in place when residents are returned to their houses.
thank you, Erica. And the questions from Sarah Plowman um, is, from CTV is, uh, why aren't people who've had their homes destroyed able to go in with insurance folks and assess? So that's a good question. We'll ask Chief Steubing. Thank you. So just to help explain the investigation process, when the fire service is called into action for a house fire, doesn't really matter if it's one or in this case, many, many, many house fires, we are required as assistance to the fire marshal to conduct a fire investigation after the fire is put out. So as part of that investigation, we're required to do origin and cause and determine if anybody was injured or killed in that fire. We have no reason to believe that is the case, but we are still finalizing our investigations. Uh, as part of that process, uh, the fire service, before turning the building over to the building owner, who would then you know, work with their insurance company, is required to uh, make the building safe if we're going to transfer ownership to somebody who's not there. So in a normal fire, it's common for us to actually pass the, after the fire's out, the investigation is complete, to pass the home over to the building owner and the insurance company take responsibility to make that building safe. Um, in other cases, that's not possible because you don't have access to the homeowner and we cannot leave those buildings unsafe, whether that's taking down a wall that's, uh, you know, maybe going to fall over, uh, oil tanks, uh, propane tanks, uh, foundations and, and walls that have been compromised. So the overall site in this case, anything that is deemed to be unsafe will be fenced off so that when other people return to the community, the community is safe. Thank you very much, uh, Chief. And I'm just checking with Erica and Bill and to say that anybody who has had their, their house destroyed, to reiterate, they will have an opportunity to speak. And assist homeowners with the rebuilding, the rebuilding. So one of the provisions would be fast-tracked or expedited planning and development approval processes, streamlined processes. We're also looking at uh, waiving building permit fees and also looking at things like property tax relief for properties destroyed by fire. We already have a policy in place around that, an administrative order, but we're looking at expanding it to more adequately uh, deal with some of the nature of the um, damages that we're seeing here, and we'll be going forward to council with that. And also, uh, we've made an application, or we're in the process of making an application to the federal government for the Housing Accelerator Fund. A report went to council on that on Tuesday. And if our request for funding is approved, we'll be looking at how we can target some of those different incentives and initiatives, particularly towards helping rebuild these areas damaged by wildfire. And I, I'll just add that, you know, we have uh, some business organizations, the Halifax Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Halifax Partnership, who are specifically looking to help businesses get who have been impacted by the fire. And I appreciate their support. We're working with them to assist businesses that need help getting back up as well. Anything else, Brenton? Uh, what he said? Um, I just want to, in closing, very briefly, just say that, you know, this, this last uh, 10 days has been, you know, remarkably devastating to the whole community and uh, in, in a way that I don't know that we've seen, I mean, in a long time. And um, it particularly affected, of course, those closest to the area. And it's tough. And we just want to work with everybody we can to assist people as they rebuild, as communities rebuild. Uh, and as communities across HRM and Nova Scotia come together to support each other. And that's the good thing about uh, where we live. Uh, people do want to help each other, and that makes a big difference. I want to thank everybody here. I want to thank the media. I want to thank those who may be watching. Um, and uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation as the fight continues. And remember, it's June the 8th. Um, we've got a lot of fire season ahead. Be careful out there. Thank you.